One Denver Bronco start on the offensive line could miss some time. Which player is going to be a task with replacing a potentially on the interior of the offensive line? Plus an update on wide receiver Jerry Judy after he underwent further testing. And who's going to get reps behind Jerry Judy if he misses an extended period amount of time? Plus we answer Broncos country question on today's brand new episode, Locked on Broncos. You are locked on Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Broncos country? Welcome back into a brand new episode of Locked On Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast here on the Locked On NFL Network, your team every day. Just a reminder, Locked On Broncos is available free and everywhere you get your podcast, not to mention a video format here on the YouTube channel. So make sure you hit subscribe so you never miss a day of coverage of all things orange and blue from the South Stands to the end zone. I'm your host as always, Cody Rourke, joined alongside co-host Sarah Benninger. Both of us, we cover the Denver Broncos for the Locked On NFL Network and Nine News. Sarah, my friend, Victory Monday felt nice. It was great to talk about the Broncos' victory in the post-game report. Now we kind of shift a little bit to the business side, right? You get to enjoy the win for 24 hours, and then you move on with the various storylines going on with the team. And then now the preparation shifts to the Jacksonville Jaguars. How you doing, man? Doing great, Cody. Yeah, I mean, like you said, it, there's a cost to winning in the NFL. And unfortunately, you know, right after you win, you kind of move on to the next. Like, all right, can we beat the next guys, right? So there's a time to enjoy it. And uh, it's it seems to be, you know, either it's completely gone or it's passing away rather quickly. So, But still, Victory Monday, it's always fun. And I uh, hope the fans enjoyed it. Hope everybody had a good time, you know, smack talking with their friends or teams that lost on Sunday, you know, or hopefully the Raiders will lose, you know, on the Monday night game and we'll have a chance for some bragging rights to be, them being the only team to lose. But football's back, man. And here we go. We got the aftermath of the victory now. Oh, the aftermath is always one of the more intricate parts. Obviously, let's give an update on wide receiver Jerry Judy. Obviously, uh, the X-ray came back negative from that standpoint. That's good. Underwent an MRI. We don't know the results of that yet, pending the time that we've sat down, recorded this podcast and this video. Obviously, something we're still going to monitor, but he did post on his Instagram that he'll be back soon. So that is a good sign, or it's just like, you know, that optimism that players have. And I think it kind of settles the nerves down to the fan base. But uh, I really want to talk about what Vic Fangio had said in his Monday press conference, meeting with the media following the Broncos' victory, traveling back from New York to Denver. He mentioned something, too, about the, whether or not the Broncos are going to bring up a wide receiver or if they were going to divvy up the reps between three guys, and those guys being Cortland Sutton, Tim Patrick moving up to that number two spot, and then now K.J. Hamler. Plus, we might see a lot of those tight ends. Definitely, definitely. And Vic Fangio, he said exactly that. What you just talked about, instead of dividing up the snaps between four guys, they only have to divide it between three. So even if they do call somebody up, Cody, I think that it's going to be primarily, obviously, Cortland Sutton, Tim Patrick, and K.J. Hamler going forward without Jerry Judy in the lineup, however long that ends up being. But also, you know, we saw quite a bit of Noah Fant, uh, Eric Saubert, Albert Okuwebunam as well. So I think we're going to see plenty of that. And the running backs, too. I think it'll be interesting to get them more involved. So Pat Shermer definitely has no shortage of, of ways that he's going to be able to incorporate playmakers into the offense. It just stinks to not have Jerry Judy, right? I mean, obviously a big time playmaker, speed, quickness, you know, he's got the goods after the catch. And and against the New York Giants, obviously, he was making some really nice, tough catches. He was making, you know, the, the play that he got injured on, in fact, was a tough catch. So I think that definitely it's going to hurt to not have Jerry Judy. But very interested by the fact that Vic Fangio wouldn't commit to putting him on injured reserve. We know that guys only have to go on IR for three weeks now. So it's not like, you know, it's not like it would be a very difficult decision if they knew that it was going to be a while. So when, when we get these vague estimations, you know, even from Judy, it's like, I'll be back soon. Or from Vic Fangio saying that he's going to miss some time, you know, that it doesn't help us any. It doesn't help quell our concerns and worries, but definitely, definitely hoping for the best for him. Hope we get to see him again really soon. Yeah, no, I agree with you there. I think that we have yet to see a season with Cortland Sutton and Jerry Judy on the field together for a full length, right? We saw, you know, a first half of that. That was great, fantastic. But man, it'd be nice to get a full season. I mean, we've also said the same thing with Bradley Chubb and Von Miller. So it's like the offensive counterpart there between those two guys. Uh, <laughs> really kind of a shocking thing that Vic Fangio revealed in Monday's press conference was that Graham Glasgow didn't travel back home with the team following the game he actually left the stadium by ambulance to the hospital because he was experiencing a regular heartbeat so some arrhythmia there and he doesn't have anything prior so 
They're doing more testing. Vic says that the tests are coming back. Everything's fine for the most part, but there's still a little bit of uncertainty about his status coming into this week. Obviously, he'll be back tomorrow, back in Denver, traveling home. But, I mean, it kind of puts his status for game two kind of up in the air. I mean, Natani Muti, I mean, we didn't know that he got too many snaps outside of watching the rewatch and seeing the snap percentage the day after the game. But uh, do you feel like the Broncos offense at this point, with this coming up with Graham Glasgow, are you concerned about maybe him not being able to play a good portion of the season if, in fact, the tests do reveal something serious? Well, I think definitely, you know, and our best wishes go out to Graham Glasgow. And and that's obviously a scary deal. You know, I've never experienced that, so I can't speak to it directly. But I imagine, you know, Vic Fangio said he was trying to kind of play through it. So I can't I can't imagine what it feels like, you know, going (laughs) through that. But obviously it got to the point where it bothered him enough that he kind of just had to. All right, let's you know, pull myself out of this game and figure it out. So definitely a scary deal. And I don't know, I don't, I don't have no experience with that. So it's really tough to say, but at the same time, you have to be extra careful. I mean, that's your heart, right? It's your heart. It's not like it's a small deal. It's not like you, you know, you dislocated a finger or something. You can just pop it back into place. It's something that you really have to monitor closely. And and thankfully for the Denver Broncos in the football side of things, thankfully they have a guy like Natani Muti who's ready, in my opinion, ready for a starting role um, and somebody who could come in and play well for them as, as long as Glasgow needs. Well, actually, as we were just recording this, Graham Glasgow just tweeted out, Hey, everyone, I appreciate all the well wishes. Looking forward to a quick recovery and getting back out there. It was a great team win and excited to see where myself – and the team go from here. Thanks. So obviously, you know, not too much clarity on his situation. Uh, we don't know how long he may be out, but we'll keep you posted here. Locked on Broncos, but Broncos country coming up here in just a moment. Sarah and I, we got a lot of questions from the avid listeners all across Broncos country. Some of the questions that they had from the the victory, also looking ahead and maybe some season long stuff that we should answer, or maybe we'll put under the microscope a little bit. But before we do that, folks, let me tell you about the sponsor of today's episode of the show. There's a good friends over there, betonline.ag. And it's that time of the year again. And all eyes are now turning to football as teams are back on the gridiron for the NFL seasons we approach here in week two. And as always, BetOnline is your number one spot for all the pro and college football action this season. You can head to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today to receive your 100% welcome bonus, and you get all the updated odds, props, and contest information, including some of the biggest contests going on, the half-million-dollar NFL Mega Contest and the world's largest $200,000 NFL Survivor Contest, all of which are open now at BetOnline.ag. BetOnline is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports from football, basketball, boxing, Right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait and take advantage of all the great offers available for the 2021 season. Go to betonline.ag today. Use promo code locked on. Betonline, your online sportsbook experts. All right, Sarah, this is one of my favorite parts every week. We get to answer Broncos fans' questions here on the show. We get a lot of responses, so we don't always get to get to every single response. We're going to try to today. We try our best, but Broncos country, if we don't get to your question here, we will answer it on Twitter, but I appreciate your interaction. And even in the comment section down below on YouTube, Sarah and I, we appreciate the time and the effort that you spend to interact with both of us and to watch our show so you can stay up to date with everything going on with the Broncos. It means the world to us, and we appreciate it. So make sure you hit that subscribe button if you feel the same way we feel about you. But Sarah, uh, you know, I'll, I'll start off with the first question that I received here today. I'm going to go with Ben Stecker at softball underscore guy. He asked the question, you're running out of your fantasy football waiver wire right now, and you're claiming one of Tim Patrick or KJ Hamler. Which one are you choosing? Now, Sarah, for me, I, I'm going to go with Tim Patrick. I think we're going to see his volume increase. Now, he had four catches yesterday. Look, and three of those moved the chains on third down. One of those moved the chains on fourth down. And he had a touchdown catch. So you know what? I'm going with Tim Patrick here. I think his volume will increase. I think so too, Cody. I think that he would be a great pickup. For me, you know, just to be just to play the other side of the coin, I'll go KJ Hamler. And I think that there was, you know, equally, you know, some some positive things to look at if you're a fantasy football player. I think KJ probably had one of the deeper average depths of target. Uh, for the Denver Broncos in this game. And he wasn't necessarily lightly targeted either. I mean, they went to him quite a bit. He had a couple of nice – he had that really nice play, the toe drag swag near the sideline for a big third down conversion. Uh, And then he had the the play that should have been a touchdown, right? It should have been a 50-yard touchdown. So we kind of talked about that before and after yesterday's show of the fact that you add that one reception for Hamler into the mix, I think definitely some fantasy value from him there, especially with him being such a different dynamic. I think – Honestly, I think you gotta you gotta try for both guys if you're a fantasy player. You gotta try for both guys and, and just see make the best of whatever happens there, kind of just take a little bit of a risk. But I'm gonna go to a question, Cody, from from our boy Anthony, Anthony B, who's uh 
just a great, great engagement with the show. Love Anthony. Love, love listening and, and, and hearing and reading and stuff that he says. But at DP Nation 22 on Twitter, everybody, if you want to go ahead and give him a follow. But he says, did you guys see any areas of concern that might bite them being the Broncos against better teams later in the season? I think that's a really interesting question. Um, because in, in my honest opinion, I don't know that we really saw much other than the, the kind of, you know, unmet expectations from the secondary. You know, you and I talked about this, Cody, the fact of, you know, we think that over time, those guys are going to really start to gel. They're going to play tighter. You know, they're going to have, they're going to have better days than, than what we saw from Sertan with the missed tackle that led to a touchdown from, from, you know, Darby who had the pass interference. That was kind of a ticky tack call, but nonetheless extended the drive. Um, Kyle Fuller, who had a penalty and a couple of big receptions that he allowed. So those are the types of things I think over the course of the season, if that stuff doesn't tighten up, if that stuff doesn't get better, I think definitely could hurt them against better teams. I agree. And, and I would say, too, missed opportunities, right? Because you, you go back to the Albert Oak way when I'm fumbled there at the four-yard line, right? And that's kind of that whole death by inches thing. Luckily, he was able to redeem himself. But, you know, when you have promising drives like that and then all of a sudden you have these turnovers, it, it's brutal. Uh, from the standpoint, when you look back, let's say if the team were to lose, you go back and you're like, man, maybe that touchdown or maybe even three points coming off that drive would have been a difference maker, you know, in a win or a loss. I mean, it happens so much to the Broncos. So I'm glad it didn't come back to snake bite them there. I think that's an actually great question. I, you know, Vic had even said to Kyle Fuller, he wants to see him, you know, work on that to where he's not allowing those many receptions. It's something that has to get worked on. He even said on Patrick Sertan's touchdown reception, he allowed Sterling Shepard. He says, you know, we could have done a little bit more to help him, but he's got to play that touchdown. Tighter. So what he means by that, it's a condensed formation, played a little bit tighter, condensed down a little bit, not inside leverage, but maybe be a little bit of head up alignment there. He's got the ability to break on it, but they want to get him more reps on the outside. So I think, you know, some things there, but I agree with you there, sir. I think that is one thing that does concern me, specifically when you go up against guys like the Washington football team uh, at some point, Terry McLaurin, them, the Los Angeles Chargers, the Kansas City Chiefs. I mean, for example, I mean, they used Keenan Allen as a running back on an angle route yesterday. So, I mean, I... I'm concerned a little bit about that. If, in fact, the Broncos secondary keeps giving up some big passing plays at the corner position, I will be a little bit worried. That is a concern there. Uh, the next one we're going to go to is Louis Fisher at LE underscore blub blub. He says, we talked about the <laughs> offense a lot, but how do you think the defense looked against the New York Giants? You know, I, I Sarah, I'd say for the first game, I'd say for the first game, I – I was okay with how they played. You know, for me, I was a little concerned about can they get pressure. Von Miller, Draymond Jones, they caused a lot of pressure. Maybe the other side where those guys weren't lined up, you know, maybe they could get a little bit more pressure, collapse the pocket. There were a couple times the Broncos interior defensive line, they got a little too far upfield. Daniel Jones snuck up underneath, specifically on a couple of second and short third down plays. You got to be able to negate those types of plays from happening. But for the most part, I thought for the first game, and a lot of these guys, is. Uh, full-on reps, more reps than they got in the preseason. I feel like they did okay. I would like to see improvement. Now, this is a big week against the Jacksonville Jaguars. Trevor Lawrence coming off of a three-interception game. Denver has to do that. I think Denver has a better defense in Houston. So if they have a, a hard time replicating that type of performance that Houston had against a, a team like Jacksonville, I'm going to be very concerned a little bit about the Broncos' defense. But as of right now, I mean, I don't think there's anything too concerning that gleams off the paper. No, definitely, especially when you get to see Von Miller come back at, you know, basically full strength is what he looked like in that game. We talked about that at our show quite a bit after the game. So definitely, you know, Von Miller's performance, Draymond Jones had a good game, Josie Jewell had a good game. Those guys' performances kind of overshadow any real major concerns from this game. And there's not, like you said, there's nothing major. I think there's things to clean up as there should be after week one. Um and so I think definitely nothing to worry about with the defense. Obviously, they, they gave up seven points. I'm not going to count that little garbage touchdown at the end of the game. They gave up yeah. seven points in this game. So I think it was – I think all is well, and I think it's definitely going to be a, a good rest of the season. So I'm I'm interested by, by this question, Cody. I'm looking forward to, to hearing what you have to say as well. But do you think – this is from Chandler Heiler, who's our buddy from Predominantly Orange. He says, do you think Denver Broncos should look outside the facility for wide receiver help? I know we talked about the, the idea of them calling somebody up from the practice squad, um, You know, be it Kendall Hinton, DeMornay pearson L, Seth Williams, um, and, and Tyree Cleveland. Those are the four guys that are currently on the practice squad. But do they go outside the organization for some wide receiver help? That would be really interesting. I know that we talked about this, Cody, after the, the waiver wire cuts were made and, and 
you know, teams kind of went through the wire and there actually weren't many wide receivers claimed, not as many as I thought there would be. Um, those guys reverted to their team's practice squads. So would be kind of interesting to see maybe you poach somebody off the practice squad. I don't know all who's available in free agency right now, but obviously if you're available in free agency right now, there's probably a, a decent reason for it. But poaching somebody off another team's practice squad, I wouldn't be necessarily opposed to that, but I'm interested to hear what you think. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be opposed to that as well, right? And I think the thought process here, if you're going to do that, if you're going to post somebody off of somebody's practice squad, you want to elevate them. I mean, obviously the Broncos, they could put Jerry on IR, but you know we don't know yet. I mean, that's the thing. So the Broncos do have a couple guys on the roster, as is Seth Williams, Tyree Cleveland. They have these two guys that could step up. But I also like the fact that what we saw from the Broncos really after Jerry Judy went down, we saw them transition a little bit from their offensive identity. You saw KJ Hamler, Tim Patrick, Cortland Sutton, but you also saw some 13 personnel. You saw a combination there of some play action stuff that, look, Teddy did a really good job of. He found Albert Okwebenum. He found Eric Saubert. He found Noah Fant consistently yesterday. Saubert had one catch on two targets, but the, the volume is there in terms of the reps, and he's he has a really good blocking technique to him. He opened up Melvin Gordon's touchdown run in a big way. So I, do the Broncos need to right now, right? I think when you look at the roster, could they maybe shift some of those allocations to a different position? I don't know at this point because, as you said, it is week one. We haven't gotten too far into the weeds just yet, but uh, I'd be interested to see if the Broncos do that. I don't think they're going to bring in a free agent, but if they do bring in anybody, I imagine Sarah might be off the practice squad route uh, that you're alluding to there. Uh, one of the final questions we get here, too, before we get into the third portion of today's episode of the show, we're going to continue answering questions there. It's going to come in from D. Woods at Stay Out the Woods. He says, winning the starting quarterback job is one thing, but is Teddy ultimately good enough to outplay a Derek Carr, a Justin Herbert, or Patrick Mahomes and bring the division title back to Denver? This is tough because we know the AFC West is tough. I mean, Kansas City won. The Chargers won against a very good Washington football team. The Broncos won. Raiders have yet to play as the time we recorded this. And I, I still think that you look at all the, the scenarios. Can Denver make some of those mistakes that they did against a team like Kansas City or the Chargers? I don't know. But then again, like – we're here in week one. You know, I think that there's going to be a lot of teams, not just the Broncos. I think you look at a lot of performances. And if you base how week one went for a lot of teams, you don't have a very good outlook for many. I think that for Denver, I think that Teddy Bridgewater protecting the football, right? I think that's the biggest key. If he plays the way he did on Sunday by protecting the football and managing, mm -hmm. extending drives, mm -hmm. keeping the opposing team's offense off of the field, in my opinion, Sarah, I feel like that gives the Broncos the best chance to beat a team like Kansas City, beat a team like the Chargers, uh, and beat a team like the Raiders. Because if, look, you can't have Patrick Mahomes or Justin Herbert on the field, you milk the, the clock, and your defense is fresh, it's hard to stop. Yeah, and that point that you just made right now, Cody, is exactly the reason why you can beat anybody in the NFL if Teddy plays the way that he did on Sunday. And that is being time of possession. You keep the best player on the on either team on the field, off the field, you know, you're going to have a pretty good chance of beating that team. You know, you keep Patrick Mahomes off the field. That's one of the only ways that you can beat him is to keep him off the field and to limit what he can do when he's on the field. Obviously, you know, and Vic Fangio has proven that he's one of the best in the league at scheming ways to do that. I know the Broncos haven't had success in the win-loss column against the Kansas City Chiefs with Patrick Mahomes under center, but they have had success against Patrick Mahomes. That's that seems crazy to say. It might seem like you're you're rocking the orange colored glasses by saying that, but it's it's just facts. It's just fa especially last season. They were one of the best teams against Mahomes, and and I would venture to say that the Buccaneers took a little bit of what Fangio did in that matchup in Kansas City and implemented it into their game plan. So I think the Broncos, obviously, with as talented as they are on both sides of the ball, Teddy Bridgewater plays the way that he did. You know, not necessarily playing keep away, but being efficient, making plays when he needs to. They can beat anybody. I agree. And, and it's going to be very fun to watch this whole season culminate a little bit and see what they do, how they improve, you know, the mistakes they make, the adversity that they could potentially face and overcome. I'm excited to see how it goes. But Broncos country coming up here in just a moment. Sarah and I are going to answer a few more questions from Broncos country as it pertains to the Broncos week two match against the Jaguars. Also, some other internal storylines that are currently impacting the team. But before we do that, let me tell you about the two other sponsors of today's episode of the show. Lockdown Broncos are good friends over there. RockAuto.com and DirecTV. Now with RockAuto.com with the ever-increasing number 
numbers of makes and models, it's now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts that you need. Why and they're often pointless or seemingly intimidating questioning and wait while the person behind the counter orders the parts in their computer choosing the only brand that their warehouse happens to carry. When you have computers with access to rockauto.com at home and in your pocket, you get a safe time and money when you use rockauto.com. I've used them multiple times. I've got a brand new steering wheel cover, a new sun shield to keep the rays out from my leather seats from drying everything out and keeping it as a sauna. I've also got new floor mats for my vehicle all through rockauto.com. And the thing I like about that, the prices are always reliably low, whether you're professional or do it yourself or not to mention they deliver it directly to your doorstep. It's easy and convenient. And I want you to go to rockauto.com today to see all the parts available for your car or truck, right? Lockdown Broncos in there. How did you hear about his box so that they know that we sent you amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need rockauto.com and our good friends over there at direct TV stream. Ladies and gentlemen, we all know that with the constant ebb and flow of what you have to do in your day to day life, sometimes we just want to relax, watch our favorite shows, pull on sports. Well, direct TV stream gives you the opportunity to do all that wherever you're at on the go free and and easy and convenient for you to be able to do so whenever you need that. And I want to tell you about a simple way you can get all the entertainment that you love without the hassle and a great way to finally get your TV together, and that's DirecTV Stream. And it brings you your live TV on-demand favorites together like never before so you can watch your favorite sports, movies, and shows all in one place. That means no more juggling remotes and no need to buy another device ever again. And the best part, there is no annual contract. So get rid of the clutter and the confusion and get your TV together with DirecTV Stream. You can learn more at DirecTV.com. Once again, that's DirecTV dot com compatible device required content varies by package all right sir jumping in the fourth quarter action today's episode locked on broncos we you know we talked about really can teddy bridgewater play in a way that can compete with guys like patrick mahomes justin herbert and Derek carr and obviously i think it was a great insight i think that they can uh, i'm gonna let you open up here the fourth quarter action today's episode of the show lockdown broncos free and available everywhere on your favorite podcast provider with a question that you received from a member of broncos country yeah from greg hunt here on twitter greg great at interacting as well uh, at hunt greg 71 so he asked what happened to Sutton? like he disappeared i mean it, it's it's definitely tough, Cody, right? I mean, coming your first game, not necessarily his very first game. Obviously, Cortland Sutton played in the preseason, but first regular season game coming off of injury, and you draw a pretty tough matchup. I think James Bradbury is a tough corner, one of the best in the league right now, a Pro Bowl caliber player. And so that's that's the matchup that you're drawing coming off of injury. That's, that's not easy. So I don't necessarily know that it was like Cortland Sutton disappeared, but he did have only one catch on three targets in this game. Obviously, they missed him deep. Uh, with Adore Jackson coverage, pretty solid coverage from Jackson on that play as well. So definitely not concerned about Cortland Sutton at this point. I didn't feel like it was like he disappeared. Uh, it was definitely, though, like he wasn't featured in this game. So interested to know your take on this one. Well, you know, I think when you look back to how Cortland was utilized, even though he wasn't seeing a lot of targets, right, three targets that you mentioned, uh, he was also blocking. I mean, he was blocking his tail off. I went back and I rewatched the game, and he stood out to me because they would motion him, and this is when they would have that multiple tight end set, and they would motion him as kind of this off off the line of scrimmage, tight to the line of scrimmage guy next to the tight end or the tackle, and they would use him to block, and I think they did a really good job of helping setting things up for guys like Javante Williams who had pop carries here and there. I mean, getting three to four yards, I'll take that all day if I'm Pat Shermer, the offensive coordinator, the coaching staff here for the Broncos. So I think for Cortland Sutton too, I, and I even said it in the offseason, Sarah, you know, don't be surprised if it takes a little bit of time for Cortland to maybe get back to where he fully was, right? I love that we saw him go deep, you know, with the Dory Jackson in coverage. You know, if that ball maybe is a little bit higher, a little bit to the outside, it might hit Sutton in stride there. But I, I like the fact that the Broncos, they had faith to test that deep, right? But then he had a big time catch on fourth down to move the chains. Momentum changing play. So I, I'm not necessarily worried about that. I think that kind of what we saw with Saquon Barkley and the Giants, Sarah, I think that the mm -hmm. Broncos are going to ease him back into the things, maybe increase his workload a little bit. But it's great that you have guys like Tim Patrick and KJ Handler. If you want to bring in a Tyree Cleveland or Seth Williams, you can get those guys reps. But I think you have the reliable tight ends to help kind of offset maybe getting Cortland acclimated. It's going to take some time because preseason, right, that third preseason game from him was fantastic. But – it wasn't against NFL starters. It wasn't against first string guys. So there is an acclimation period. I would imagine kind of what we saw at Bradley Chubb last year. 
we might see something very similar in that regard here for Sutton. So now I wouldn't worry about it just yet, Broncos country. But if his targets start to dissipate and we don't see it and he's getting open, I think when we go back and re re revisit the film here in a few weeks, then Sarah, I think that'll become a problem that we talk about if that does happen. But uh, I think that's a great question there, obviously, from Greg. Uh, the final one I'm going to give off here comes from Caden Stobb. He says, do you think that there is any chance the Broncos try to work out a contract with Teddy Bridgewater during the season if this type of play continues or will it be a wait till the offseason? Only curious because if, if week 10 comes around and Teddy is even 80% of what he was yesterday or on Sunday, that man will need to be paid. And look, I think this is a tough dilemma, Sarah, because right, you know, let's not be coy about this. There's the interest by the Denver Broncos in Aaron Rodgers. I mean, even Ian Rappaport had said it Sunday morning leading up to kickoff. I think that where we saw in week one from the Green Bay Packers, you saw, you know, based on how Teddy played and how Aaron Rodgers played, so many people are like, oh, yeah, we don't want Aaron Rodgers. You know, we want Teddy. I understand the hype and the emotion, the excitement. Look, I love Teddy Bridgewater's leadership. You can tell his teammates really love him. A couple of Broncos mm -hmm. offensive players I've spoken to, they have said that Teddy is a great guy in that locker room, not to mention what he does for the offensive line on Thursday nights. You know what he does there? He takes them out for dinner. Sometimes they go out and they have right. steak dinner. You know steak dinner for an offensive lineman is a big thing. But even just seeing him celebrating with the offensive line coming up to them after the game, I mean, that that right there, I think, is something I think it happens for many NFL teams, but we don't always get to see it. But for the Broncos, I think it's big because I don't think that that's been there for this team in quite some time. There really hasn't been. So I like that. Uh, you know, outside of that, I just don't know if you pay Teddy Bridgewater now, right? I, definitely not now because, look, it's only week one. But at the end of the season, I think you have to wait it out to the end of the season. And if you're really pleased with how he played, and obviously they're going to be gauging the waters with Green Bay about Aaron Rodgers after the season ends as to whether or not whatever they want to do, I think you have to wait. I, I think if you make a brass decision right now, I think you kind of jump the gun a little bit. Look, if Aaron Rodgers becomes available, I mean, who wouldn't jump on the opportunity to do that end season? I don't think it's going to happen. But then again, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, it's tough to tough to watch, you know, for Aaron Rodgers in that Week One performance that he had. Ha <clears throat> excuse me, that he had against the New Orleans Saints definitely wasn't vintage Aaron Rodgers by any means. It was one of his worst ever. And uh, it looks clear to me that he's disengaged, which coming off the heels of Ian Rappaport's report that the Broncos would have interest should he become available via trade in the offseason definitely definitely makes things a little bit more interesting, right? But like Caden said, and Caden's a, you know, a great, great follow on Twitter, great person to interact with as well. If Teddy Bridgewater plays like this, and we mentioned this too, if he continues to play like this, Cody, I think all the things, all the preconceived ideas that we had going into this thing are kind of out the window. You know, Teddy Bridgewater is only what, 28, 29 years old. It's not like he's it's not like he's 34 years old and, and is, has been a journeyman for the last 12 years. He's still a younger guy. And at the quarterback position, we're seeing a lot of guys defy the laws of father time. And they're playing late into their 30s and they're playing well late into their 30s. Aaron Rodgers being one of them. It's hard to imagine that if Teddy continually plays like this, that the Broncos wouldn't at least consider that idea based on the fact that he could be potentially a long-term fix. But how would you pass on Aaron Rodgers? I mean, that's such a tough dilemma. If Teddy plays as well as he did uh, on, on Sunday for the rest of the year, let's say, and then Aaron Rodgers becomes available and, and plays pretty well most of the season, how do you make that decision if you're George Payton? You know, I mean, that's Ooh. that's tough. That's a really <laughs> brutal dilemma to have to, to have to even consider. Oh, I look at it, you know, in a, in a multitude of ways here, right? Because obviously, Aaron Rodgers is is older. You know, he can still play really good football. I mean, what we saw it was it was weird on Sunday against the New Orleans Saints. I don't know what that was from Rodgers, but uh, also at the same exact time, too, Teddy Bridgewater is younger and has a lot more time left. And who's to say? What if Teddy Bridgewater all of a sudden has this Ryan Tannehill like scenario in Denver, a new environment? I mean, I don't think people should write that off. I think that everyone's like, oh, we know who Teddy is, but I think it's way too premature to say, hey, who's to say Teddy Bridgewater? can't turn his career around in Denver. I think the Broncos would be very, very interested in that. And Sarah, I, I know that's going to be something we're going to follow all season long. I know Broncos country in the comment section and those who listen to this podcast, they'll be intrigued as well. But obviously the tune has changed a little bit on Teddy with the fan base, which is great. But now can the Broncos build and maintain on that? That's the biggest key for Teddy Bridgewater. That's the biggest key for Pat Shermer and this offense and this team in general, because the schedule will eventually get tougher 
And I want to see how the Broncos play in those matches. But, Sarah, it was great, as always, to break down another episode of Lockdown Broncos with you here today, my friend. Tomorrow's episode of the show. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a special guest. It is da -da 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 -da, Tim Jenkins. We're going to have Tim Tuesdays here on the podcast. He's going to talk about what he saw going back on the All-22, watching Teddy Bridgewater, watching Pat Shermer. Have the Broncos made some adjustments offensively that should keep Broncos fans promisable or at least have hope throughout the re remainder of the season. Tim Jenkins breaks it down with us on tomorrow's brand-new episode, Locked on Broncos.